want you to think back to what kind of TV did you have when you were growing up? I think back to our dairy farm I grew up on back in the 70s. We had on our TV, you had three channels. If the president was on, your night was shot. You had to go find something else to do. Usually at our house when the TV was on, if the weather was on, it was the Dewey Burquest weather show that was on. Or for sports, it was usually Boyd Christensen uh, that was on the TV. And so we have all these wonderful memories. But I want you to remember something else from the TV. This came on quite often. All of a sudden, you hear this long beep on your TV, and then these words would come up. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. The broadcasters of your area in voluntary cooperation with the FCC, federal, state, and local authorities have developed this system to keep you informed in the event of an emergency. If this had been an actual emergency, you would have been instructed to tune in to one of the broadcast stations in your area. And I swear this always came on in the middle of my favorite programs, not any other time. But this was our warning system. This was our voice of one calling in the wilderness. Now this was a warning system in case um, there was a, a, you know, a, an emergency or let's say there were, back in that day and age, just attacked by the Soviet Union. And it was set up for those particular reasons and you know, many others. The Jewish people had a warning system also. He was called, not EBS, but he was called John the Baptist. Because the people were living in dark times. John chapter 1 verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The darkness that John is talking about there is the darkness of sin, the darkness of a world living without God. And into this comes John the Baptist to warn the people to prepare for the coming of Jesus. We go to Luke chapter 3 and we begin with verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. When we look at John's message, we see that it was a message that was a warning, but it was a message that brought hope. It was a message that says change, but it was also a message that said something wonderful will happen if you change. John was preaching that if you heed this message, if you listen to it, take it to heart and do something about it, your life will be different. You will no longer be in darkness, but you will be in light. I want us to look at John's message, John the Baptist's message, what it means for us. But also, I, I want to propose to you that we, in our day and age, need to become John the Baptist ourselves. I'll explain that a little bit later. When we look at John's message, or when we look at some of the things in Scripture, I always look at it, okay, break it down. How many points are there? Well, let's see, and this is one, two, okay, that'll be a three-point sermon. Well, there's only two points here. John had one point <laughs> to his message. It was this, prepare the way. How do you prepare? John was saying, repent. Repent and be baptized. In other words, when he said repent, he was saying to the people, the Messiah is coming, Jesus is coming, do not let him find you living in <coughs> sin. Do not let him find you living in darkness. And John was saying, when there is repentance, then Jesus comes in. That's how you prepare the way. You repent, and Christ comes into your life. 
Now, a lot of times we talk about, okay, what does repentance mean? Well, the classic definition of repentance means literally to turn away. You're heading towards sin if you repent. You turn away and you walk towards God now. But I think what we need to look at, and sometimes we overlook this, is what is it that must take place in our lives first before repentance can happen? And I think there's three things that must take place. Now, or three steps. Now, I'm not saying it's, this has to happen first, this has to happen second, this has to happen third. Sometimes they happen all at once. What kind of time period are we talking about? For some people, it happens in a matter of minutes. For other individuals, it might be weeks or months. Um, my dad, for over 20 years, he prayed for his brothers that they would come to the, know the Lord. And they did. It took that long before they repented. It took that long before these three things became a part of their life. So what are the three things I'm talking about? To prepare the way, first of all, the first step before we get to repentance is that person needs to realize their present condition. Let's look at what scripture says. John chapter 12, verse 46. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. The people were living in darkness, and that is a metaphor or an analogy to living a life of sin, living a life without God. They were in darkness. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, the condition of the human race. Romans 3, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, and there is no one who seeks God all have turned away, and they have altogether become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Without God in our lives, that is humanity's position, separated from God, living in sin, living in darkness. And John came along reminding people, that's where you're living. So, first of all, a person has to begin to realize what is their present position, what is their present condition. Second, the second step to repentance is to realize this change comes from Christ. It's not found anywhere else, it's found in Christ. Now, I could give you a lot of different verses. I could quote John 3.16, many others, but there's one verse I want to quote out of Ephesians chapter 2. It says this. But now in Christ, you who were once far away, your condition, you didn't know God, you were far away, have been brought near by what? By the blood of Christ. So that repentance, that forgiveness is found in Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And the book of Acts, Peter says, there is no other name given under heaven by which people must be saved than the name of Jesus. The source of forgiveness is found in Christ's death on the cross. And that's, it's found in Jesus, and that's who John was pointing the people to. He said, hey, there is one coming who is greater than I. And he pointed them. Jesus. And I think the third step, the third thing that takes place that leads a person to repentance is when that individual begins to realize how much, how much better life would be with God than without God. And that's what John was pointing out also. Here's how you're living now. Look what can happen when you live for God. Let's go back to the story of the uh, prodigal son. The prodigal son, he walked away from his father. He went off to live his own life, do his own thing, live without uh, being under the father's, let's say, control or influence. And he made a mess of his life. And in fact, he squandered all his wealth. He ends up in a pig pen feeding 
pigs slopping hogs. He begins to fight the pigs for the food. And he's sitting there one day and he begins to realize, look at how good I had it with my father. And look at how I'm living. That's what John was pointing out to the people. This is how you're living now. But look what, and basically I think John was saying to people, here's what Jesus can do for you. Look at the joy and the love that you can be experiencing. When a person realizes their position, when a person realizes where repentance can be found, when a person realizes how much better it is to live for God, then they take that step of repentance. But that doesn't happen until somebody says something. John is called the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Now like John, that should be our message. As believers in the Lord, that should be our message to a world people who do not know God. Here is your position. Here is where you can find forgiveness. Here is what happens to your life. Here is what God can do for you. And we do this by being that voice of crying in the wilderness. We can be that voice calling in the wilderness, especially by our actions, by how we live. John, now all of us do not have the fortitude that John did to just go out and start preaching to people. <laughs> but we can be a voice of calling in the wilderness by how we live our life. There was a book written many years ago, back in the 70s even, and it's, and it's still an appropriate book for today. I remember reading it for one of my classes in Bible college. It's called Lifestyle Evangelism. <clears throat> Living out your faith. Being a witness by how you live. John picks up on this. John grabs hold of this. Of witnessing to others by how you live. And he tells us that if we have prepared the way, if we have prepared the way and we have repented and Christ in our life, then we can help others to prepare the way by how we live. And we find this in Luke chapter 3, going down to verse 10. People have come to John and repented, and then they ask, what now? Okay, verse 10. What should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. John is telling the people here, when you come to the Lord, change how you live. Become a person who shares. You see someone in need, if you have repented and living for God, you're going to do something about it. You see someone in need, you're going to share what you have. That's what Jesus did. John is saying, live a life of sharing. Now some other people came to him. Verse 12, even tax collectors came to be baptized. <clears throat> Meaning they repented and were baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Do not collect any more than you are required to be told. What is John saying? Well, let's just, we can sum up what John is saying in one simple word. How are the tax collectors supposed to live? Honestly. John says if you're going to follow God, be honest in your actions, in your thoughts, in your words, in your deeds, in all that you do. And then there was even some soldiers who came to him and asked, what should we do? He replied, do not extort money. Do not accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. When he is saying to them, do not accuse people falsely, do not extort money, he's saying several things there. He's saying to those soldiers, act fairly. Act justly. Show mercy. 
Is that not what Micah chapter 6, 8 says? Has he not shown you, O people, what does the Lord require of you? But to love mercy and to act justly and to walk humbly with your God? Well, John is saying, here's how you walk with God. Here's how you live out your faith each day. By living a life of sharing. By living a life of honesty. By living a life of fairness and, and loving mercy. By changing your actions. Notice in each one of these cases, John is calling them to change how they are living. Yes, they've repented. Now he says change. Turn away from those things, literally. Give feet to that repentance. And do not do those things you did once before. We become a voice in the wilderness. When we live a life that is visible on how Christ can change people's lives. People will look at our life and say, I see the change in you. You know, I want that too. That looks pretty good. Like the prodigal son in the pig pen. They look up and go, oh, that's a lot better than what I'm doing right now. I want that. We can help people prepare the way. We can be that voice of one calling in the wilderness. At the care center this past week, I did the worship service there. Um, and one of the, uh, I, a lot of times I like to use a PowerPoint presentation so people can see pictures. Or This time I, I took some visible objects with me. One of them was one of the candles from our candlelight service, and I lit it. And I said, you know, in, in Matthew it says we are to be a light. We are to be a city set on a hill. And then it went on to say nobody likes a lamp. And then covers it with a bowl. But they let it shine in the darkness. I then told the story of how when my wife and I were living in Montana, we went to Lewis and Clark Caverns and visited that. And they, took, and they take you way down to the very bottom. Then um, the, the guide says, okay, everybody kind of get close together. Everybody stay, do not move no matter what happens. He says, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn out the lights. So don't move an inch. And he says, when I turn out the lights, I want you to put your hand directly in front of your face. And he turned out the lights, and you couldn't even, you couldn't even find your face. <laughs> it was so dark. And then he lit a little candle. And it was just amazing how that candle, that little light, pierced that darkness and how much you could see. If we take seriously living for God each day, it's amazing how much of a light we will be to the people around us because people are watching. John the Baptist was a voice of one calling in the wilderness. We can be the same. We can be that voice in the wilderness of sin. In a world of darkness. John pointed people to Jesus. May our lives point people to Jesus and not away. Let us pray. Father, we ask that we would be that light to this world. With our words, but more importantly, with our actions, with our very lives. May we be that John the Baptist to the community here and to the